Okay, we're starting. Um, it was really wild walking past a queue to get into this room to see me talk. <laughs> I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm obviously ex-intelligence, but I'm not going to be divulging any state secrets here. In fact, definitely the opposite, because obviously like someone is watching this, so <laughs> I don't want to get in big trouble or arrested. Um, but it's, it's amazing to see you all here, so thank you. Um, so this is a talk about the intersection of AI and security, specifically from the national security lens. Um, this is a policy village talk that is up here on the creator stage. So there is a policy slant to it. So if you're expecting to see cool like hacking techniques or how to evade an APT, this is not the talk, um, although maybe I will talk about it. Um, but I hope you're all here because you're interested in policy in some way. Could I get a show of hands if you are like a policy person? Okay, that's good, that's good. <laughs> and what if you're more of a technical person, like a cyber or an AI person? Okay, so probably a bit more, but a, a good mix. Okay, that's okay. Um, hopefully this is interesting for you. I don't know, um, we'll see. So who am I? Um, my name is Harriet Farlow. I've worked at the intersection of artificial intelligence and security for about 10 years now. My undergraduate degree was in physics and like many physicists, I didn't really know what to do with it. So I ended up working in data science. <laughs> Why is there a laugh there? Um, so I ended up working in data science, um, mostly specializing in defense projects um, in Australia. So I spent a year working on the patrol boats in Darwin. And if anyone's familiar with Darwin, it's, it's a small town far north in Australia where there's obviously a lot of military activity and crocodiles and that's sort of what's going on, but an insane number of British backpackers and it's, it's, it's loose all the time. Um, and I also worked on sort of Air Force projects where we were augmenting people's roles with um, like robotic process automation. Um, ideally, hopefully not to, you know, take people's jobs away, right, but just to make them not have to do the, the uncool bits. Um, I worked there for a while, um, had my you know, quarter life crisis, ended up working at a startup in New York City, which is really cool. And I was also working on sort of advising large companies in the United States on AI and cybersecurity. Uh, unfortunately, during COVID, I had to move back home um, and the Australian government was the only people hiring. <laughs> so that's how I ended up working in intelligence. Um, not to make it sound like I didn't want to, I was really grateful to, and it's something that I'd always been really interested in. Um, and I guess COVID just forced me into that opportunity. Um, but it was really great. I worked at the Australian Signals Directorate in Australia, which is our equivalent of the NSA. I always get scared about saying the wrong thing. So yeah, like this is not gonna be the spiciest talk, obviously, um, because I'm scared of saying the wrong thing. So this is, this is ASD and this is what they do. They're the Australian Government Intelligence Agency responsible for foreign signals, intelligence and cybersecurity, and they do all those things. And so over the time I was working there, I was mostly a data scientist in the cybersecurity teams. Um, and by the time I left, I was acting as a technical director on one of their sort of AI streams. And through this job, I got to travel to Canada and the USA and lead some of the technical work around AI in that space there as well, which is really great. Um, Fantastic organization, fantastic people. I believed in the mission wholeheartedly, but I guess the entrepreneurial spirit never really left me. Um, and while I was there, I started doing my PhD in adversarial machine learning and investigating ways to hack models and basically found that in the, like the, the, the private sphere, there was just not that much activity happening in that space, even though there was, um, you know, that it represented a real threat. So I left my government job and for the last year I've been running an AI security company called Maleva Security Labs. Um, we've just received funding to start building a tech product, which is exciting, especially because there's, there's so much grind, it's, it's a long time. But that's who I am. Um, I also have a social media presence at Harriet Hacks, which is, I don't know, not amazing, but <laughs> I'm trying. Um, I'm there on YouTube, um, you can reach out to me on uh, like X and uh, other platforms. And we have a podcast now, which is really cringy, but um, anyway, you know, it, as an entrepreneur, you just got to do what you got to do. Um, so I've been doing quite a lot of research at the intersection of AI and security for a while. This is my fourth talk this week. 
So if I am a bit like foggy or tired, I apologize. It's been a massive week and I don't think I've ever needed a drink so much as I will right after this talk. <laughs> But yesterday, um, well, I spoke at B-Sides and then the main stage yesterday and the AI village yesterday um, on some of the methods that are used uh, and, and new methods to uh, hack facial recognition AI models. Um, and that's in the field of adversarial machine learning, which is my PhD topic. And in particular, um, the, the content I was talking about was in the context of urban camouflage. That's sort of how I um, envisioned it um, at, at the time that I they created that method. Um, but basically the idea is that machine learning models are pretty bit brittle and easily exploitable and that most of the organizations that are leveraging machine learning um, are relying on pretty insecure models, even though lots of organizations are doing the right thing. Like it's, it's really cool to see um, AIXCC if you've been there and all the companies like um, Google, Microsoft, Anthropic, OpenAI that are working on secure AI. But for all the other organizations that are creating AI products, there's no real mandate for them to actually be secure. And, and that's part of the problem. Um, some other talks were showing that. But I also do research um, on policy as well and applying that in the policy sort of lens. And maybe it sounds really bad, but I'm far more excited to deliver this talk <laughs> than the other ones. Um, I, I never really thought that I would consider myself a policy nerd. It, it always seemed pretty dry. Um, especially when you work in the bureaucracy and you have to try and create policy, like that just sucks. But it's actually really interesting to think about the, the impacts of policy because it is real. Um, so now if someone called me a policy nerd, I would probably actually be quite happy about that, uh, which is an identity crisis slash shift I guess I've gone through. But that sort of leads us into the objectives of this talk, which uh, I hope it's not too theoretical for you. It kind of has to be, but I find it really interesting actually. So maybe if there's something you take away from this, it's that policy can actually be quite interesting and, and important. Um, so I'm going to cover some of the different ways that AI um, is used in a national security context, cyber defense and offense. I'm sure this will not be surprising to you at all. Um, so I'll just go over that lightly, but then I'll talk about some of the national security implications from that, uh, from my perspective. And then you might be disappointed by this as well, but I'm going to talk about security theory because I actually find it really interesting. And I think it's really interesting to see how traditional security theory that stemming from sort of military sciences has moved into cyber security, but hasn't really moved into AI security yet. And, and how we can sort of encourage that change to make sure that AI also is secure um, as, as, our other, other, as our other disciplines. But first, so this is an AI, uh, po the, the Policy Village talk, and they told me in submitting this talk that it had to be interactive with the audience and that it had to encourage discussion. So I, I feel like maybe that's a bit different as a creator stage like this, I think like maybe in the policy uh, area, that's a bit easier, but I do still think it's important actually. So maybe take 30 seconds and say hello to the person next to you. Um, you can explain why you're interested in policy and then note your favorite sci-fi movie. If you read the description, obviously I'm talking about sort of leaning into sci-fi here. So I'm gonna break for 30 seconds and you, you can meet the people around you. Okay, well, that's a minute. I hope everyone found that valuable. <laughs> okay, we can pause the talking now. We're gonna, we're gonna kill the, the audio for the, for the recording. Okay, great. Well, I've ticked that box for, for the policy people. So I hope you found that useful as well. 
Um, that is the benefit of being here, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I'll try audience engagement. I was going to say, can someone yell out their favorite sci-fi movie? That might work. Terminator. Terminator, yes. Classic use of AI. Anything else? Star Wars. Star Wars. Blade Runner. Yes, Blade Runner. Fantastic. Well, all of them involve AI, right? Which is, uh, uh, I guess, funny, but sort of the point of why I wanted to involve sci-fi in the talk. Um, also because then it's easy to talk about stuff without necessarily saying that, um, you know, it comes from experience. Uh, I should make the disclaimer, actually, all of this is my own opinion and nothing from ASD. Um, I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, but that is the benefit of leaning into the, the science fiction narrative as well. Because all of those movies that you've referred to do involve artificial intelligence. And see, the way that it's depicted in movies really does, I'm sure that will come back, it really does impact how people think about it and the kinds of narratives that people have about it. Um, as well as sort of in the world of intelligence, right, all of the things we think about when it comes to national security and intelligence, all of, a lot of the time, unless you've worked in those kinds of fields or with people in those fields, come from movies. It's, it's really impactful. Um, and there have been quite a lot of studies that show that the, the way that technology is constructed in movies is how it progresses. Not necessarily, but the, the creativity that's shown in, um, in narratives like this ends up, you know, informing people who then go and design them themselves. We've seen that in sort of biotech. So this is important when it comes to AI because we need to think about it. But these are some of my favorite science fiction, oh, those were some of my favorite science fiction movies. I think it'll come back. Um, there we go. Um, they all also involve AI. Um, if you've read the description, which I can't really remember what I put in it actually, but I think I referenced um, Ghost in the Shell, Neuromancer, um, Mission Impossible, not really a sci-fi movie, but it's a, an action movie that I do quite enjoy, um, especially the last one because it involved some examples of hacking AI, which I really like and is the kind of thing that I do and had not seen in movies very much before. I also put Doctor Who up there because I'm not talking about it today, but it is my favorite science fiction show slash content. My, um, I don't know if you can tell that I was a, a nerd because I studied physics, but my sweet 16th birthday party was a Doctor Who themed party. And, <laughs> and it's even amazing that I had friends to come to this at the time, but they all came dressed up as different Doctor Who characters. Um, and I was Rose, of course, and I made a, my own custom Doctor Who Cluedo game. Um, I created all the different cards and characters myself and then stuck them on top of my original Cluedo. So I guess we're all impacted by science fiction in some way. And now you are too because of that really terrible story. But I'm going to be sort of discussing some of the implications of the technologies that we see in these movies. But of course, there is an important question we have to ask. And what is AI at all? Have any of you in here been to the other talks I gave this week? Okay. Because I've there's a really bad joke that I have about what AI is and I don't know whether to give it again because I've given it three times already this week and it's really bad. Oh, okay, so when I first told my mum I work in AI, she said, oh darling, why do you work in artificial insemination? <laughs> Which is really like, it's not a good joke. Um, but it's because she works in medicine and that's what AI meant to her. And she wasn't even saying that to be funny. That, that's literally the first thing that came to her mind. Um, and so even when I say I, AI to all of you, you think artificial intelligence, what that means to different people is really different. So some people would think something like the Terminator or Skynet. Um, other people would think like just a decision-making algorithm. Um, I have friends who aren't really tech people and I was talking to them about AI and they said, oh yeah, I saw this really fancy like 3D billboard in the street. That's an example of AI, right? So I think we also take it for granted that, you know, maybe we're a bit more technically literate than most people out there, um, including people who work in sort of, um, you know, policy and a lot of, a lot of government jobs, uh, which is not, you know, not a, not to discredit their work or anything. It's just that it's such a new and emerging technology and we need to have a bit of empathy for the people who really aren't there. But I guess when I talk about AI, when we think about it, artificial intelligence really refers to a goal. And the term artificial intelligence has been around since the 1950s when John McCarthy coined the term for the Dartmouth Conference in 1956. And he was a cybernetics researcher. And so 
like he was trying to get grant funding for his cybernetics research, which is basically the ability to just like create models. Um, and at the time in the 1950s, that was pretty simplistic. But over the years, whatever we've referred to as AI has just referred to the cutting edge, right? So I guess these days you, you would consider AI something like LLMs and ChatGPT, but in 10 years time, what we consider AI will, will change as well. So the goalposts are always moving. The other thing about definitions in AI is also that when I say AI security, so like when I say I, I run an AI security company, what that means is also very different. Most people assume AI security means AI for cybersecurity. Um, whereas for me and other people who sort of work in the field, what I really mean is the security of AI systems themselves. And they're very different, like they're inherently different. It's either using AI to do something um, like cybersecurity applications versus like implementing or adopting security methodologies into the world of AI, which are like very different to how you would implement it in a cybersecurity setting. And then another term is AI safety, which some people would consider to be kind of the same as AI security and I would consider quite different. Um, and why that is, I will sort of get to in a moment as well. But when we think of all the different AI uses in like security, we can sort of group them into offensive and defensive security. So in terms of the different job roles, uh, we have things like ethical hackers, red teamers, exploit developers, malware analysts, vulnerability researchers, social engineers, um, just to name a few. These are all the kinds of roles that are now being, um, you know, supplanted or augmented by AI technologies. When we think of defensive security, we have things like security analysts, network security engineers, security architects, incident responses, SOC analysts and threat hunters. Um, again, just to name a subset. And there is so much work and investment going on in this space at the moment. Um, again, looking at AI CC in the, in the hall below, which is insane and massive and so much funding. And I just can't imagine that happening in Australia. Um, again, not to bash Australia, but just like, this is such an incredible investment from the government in, in that, so that's really cool. And the, the challenge about applying AI in these kinds of settings in any, in any organization, national security or not, is that like actually building the model itself is pretty, pretty simple, but making it work, making it work as part of a system is really hard. Um, I, I do sort of have a demo, um, I guess it's worth showing, but I, I think the, the point of the demo is really just to show how simple it is to build like a, a model that, that does this kind of thing. So as part of our work, we're often thinking about like the intersection of AI and security. We do demos, labs, all that kind of stuff. Um, we, we were originally like trying to apply for AXCC, but like we're a small company, we couldn't quite get it together enough to do it in time. Um, but as a, as a demo, we decided to build a model that could classify vulnerabilities in code. Um, I know a lot of you might not be code people. The point of this is just to show that in the, like this is at two times speed, but in the three minutes that this notebook takes to run, we were able to um, down, well, we were able to download a bunch of code, secure and insecure code, um, build a model that was able to classify which of this code was secure or insecure. Um, run that a few times, you can sort of see this training process here. And then when it was presented new code, it could correctly classify whether it was vulnerable or not. Um, and that's the whole point of the AI XCC challenge. But actually applying this at scale is really, really hard. And so some of the troubles that we see in applying AI in all of these settings is this whole idea of like moving beyond the pilot stage, like actually getting these sorts of models to speak together is really difficult and it's not trivial. And it's something that we're all grappling with. Um, and the reason that it's important from a sort of policy perspective, I guess, is because like the kinds of organizations who are working on this stuff, um, you know, the big tech giants, um, or, or as in like who have that sort of that AI capability and have the compute to be able to do this. Um, this is a really novel challenge, right? Like in the past, we've seen governments have quite a lot of power when it comes to the technologies that are challenging 
So you've probably heard of like the crypto wars in the 90s and the noughties and like the, the challenge that different governments and national security organizations were having around people using end-to-end -end encryption and their inability to sort of get through that and how they can now, um, you know, mandate different bodies to be able to either like bypass that or they were trying to do things like uh, main mandate implants into different technologies. In Australia in particular, there was some recent controversial legislation that would also sort of mandate companies to, or at least pro provide the ability to mandate companies to open those, those back doors as well. But being able to like do that in an AI setting when we're talking about like applying these models to really difficult use cases um, is, is a real challenge that we're seeing in the policy space at the moment. Like how do we actually do that? How do governments cooperate with like with these different companies? And that's something that we're trying to figure out now. Um, so if you consider that a bit of a summary of how AI for security in an offensive and defensive um, like fashion is used. Um, of course, I feel like I have to touch on hacking with AI. There have been some really high profile cases of um, APT groups, so advanced persistent threats, um, trying to use, um, you know, AI created by big companies like OpenAI and Anthropic to do hacking for them and to augment this. Um, is this a real threat? I mean, yes and no. I think the way to think about artificial intelligence is that it augments existing efforts, right? So we've seen quite a lot of hype around how this can be, um, I guess, a revolutionary challenge um, and how it's a, a really big deal. And maybe that's not really the right way of thinking about it, but, but thinking about it as more of a tool because we're still sort of waiting to see like the kind of impacts that people are, are promising we might see. Um, there are two examples of like APT groups that have been using AI that I can sort of think of off the top of my head. Um, Russia and Iran, for example, have been doing it to create deep fakes, um, to sort of augment existing, um, you know, ways to make money for them, um, I guess is a way of sort of putting it bluntly. Um, but I think the right way to think about it again is that it's part of the kill chain. It's not necessarily a new a new technology um, or a new threat, but it's really how it augments the existing kill chain and amplifies those sorts of efforts. I hope the, I can't tell how often the screen is doing that, so I hope it's not too annoying. Um, we, we've seen examples of this from all of the different APT groups um, to different extents. Um, and this is just a selection of them as well. But I, I feel like quite a lot of talks do focus on things like AI for hacking. And I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole because that's not really the thing that I'm interested in. The thing I'm interested in is more of the, the strategic so what, um, which again, might not be all that interesting for some people. But the thing I care about is like, how do we actually approach all those different issues of you know, AI for security and security of AI? Because especially working in an AI security field, I see there is so much talk about AI for security. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of smart people thinking about it. I don't think that's really the problem, problem at the moment. I think the problem right now is that not many people or not enough people are talking about the security of the AI systems themselves. So let's think about how we hack an AI system at all. So I guess you could say that the idea of hacking an AI has been around as long as AI systems have themselves, you know, especially whatever we define as AI, right? So the first example that comes to mind is a simple algorithm, like a, an email spam filter. As long as those have been around, people have been trying to evade spam filters. And you could think of that as an example of hacking an AI system. Um, when we think about the modern or the, the most recent implementation of, of AI hacking, it's the field of adversarial machine learning, which is sort of my field and the topic of my PhD and my other research. Um, but it's basically ways that you can exploit the inherent characteristics of machine learning models. And machine learning models are the underpinning of most or, or all AI systems at the moment. And so in the real world, we're starting to see these kinds of attacks possibly come to fruition. It's always been considered a very academic discipline. 
Um, this is sort of the classic adversarial machine learning example. Can I get a show of hands if anyone's like seen this before or familiar with adversarial machine learning? Okay, so it, it's definitely entering more of the discourse at the moment, but the idea at its heart, um, and this is from a paper about 10 years ago now, so it's, it's new, but it's not that new. The idea was that you could take a clean image, so of this panda, and you could create special noise that when superimposed on top of that image prevents a model from recognizing it. And the idea is that this, this noise or these adversarial perturbations, this adversarial example, is crafted specifically with the target model in mind and that you're able to constrain it within a small epsilon value so that a human can't recognize it. It's just enough that it passes a sort of classification boundary according to the model, but not so much that it's recognized. And this is sort of the, I guess, the proverbial example that most people um, show when they talk about adversarial machine learning. And it's always been considered a bit of an academic threat. Like it wasn't necessarily taken seriously. When I told my PhD supervisors this is what I wanted to work on, they were like, I don't know if this will ever become a thing. You know, it might not, you know, you might be shooting yourself in the foot, this AI security thing. Um, times have changed. It was also Australia. Again, love Australia, but it's... <laughs> I'm not trying to, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's always, um, yeah, it's a smaller market. Um, so now we're starting to see more examples in the wild, as you'd call it. So things like being able to paint special paint onto a stop sign so that like an autonomous vehicle doesn't recognize it and would drive straight through. And this is just in computer vision, right? So computer vision is a kind of machine learning where you're looking at the world around you and identifying what it is. Um, but when we think about all of the different use cases of AI, there's things like natural language processing and then LLMs, um, signal classification, RF, radio frequency, audio waves, those are all use cases for machine learning where all of these kinds of attacks apply as well, but they're harder to see, like they're even harder to see. And if we think about machine learning systems as what well, you know, you'd call them an attack surface, right? As you'd use the, the cyber sort of lexicon. You can think about all of these different attack surfaces that have their own unique characteristics, all the different kinds of models that do different things. So at the top, we have a convolutional neural network, which is a kind of machine learning model that's really good for computer vision because it decomposes information down really easily. Um, and then on the bottom, we have a transformer, which is the backbone of, of GPT models and is very good at natural language processing. Those are very different kinds of models. Like they have some commonalities in the sense that it's all about optimization and being able to you know, predict things, whether it's next words or images. Um, but they're really quite different. They're different attack surfaces. And especially if we're adding these to cyber systems, they present entirely new threats. Like this is a, an extension of the existing cyber attack surface. Um, that is not covered by existing cybersecurity methodology. You know, for the organizations that are adopting AI without thinking about the security of them, um, they're, they're opening themselves up to new vulnerabilities. So this is sort of the example that I gave in my other talks. It's being able to add different adversarial um, like regions, distributed regions to images so that you can sort of hack facial recognition. You can do this with any kind of model really. Um, the reason I was so excited to see the recent Mission Impossible movie is because this is what they did. I was, it was really great. Um, there was this scene where Ethan Hunt was running through an airport and people were looking at the surveillance footage and someone was able to digitally manipulate the surveillance footage so that he looked like somebody else. And the thing was that they didn't need to do it in the real world because the people were only looking at the surveillance footage. And it's the kind of thing where you know, a lot of AML techniques or adversarial machine learning techniques, they were considered too academic because people couldn't really see how it could relate to the real world. Like, how do you put in a bunch of adversarial pixels in a real world and move it around? But, you know, the point is that you don't always need to, especially now that machine learning models are doing a lot of this kind of stuff autonomously, you know, in the national security setting, especially, you know, you have a lot of uh, models that are being built to do things like platform detection, looking for uh, you know, tanks and ships and boats and things, um, person identification. Um, you don't always need to rely on having something in the real world anymore. A lot of it's digital and a lot of this kind of stuff can be injected, just like in Mission Impossible. So this is where we get to something that I find really interesting. So bear with me. Um, there's some security studies, uh, I guess, theory 
that is really interesting to apply to AI and AI security. Um, a few particular things are thinking about the referent object, the direction of protection, and securitization. Um, so what do I mean by these things? The referent object basically refers to the thing that you're trying to protect. Um, so security studies comes from sort of military security um, and then is now being applied to like cyber security um, more rigorously. But it, it basically means uh, if we're creating um, policy or legislation or you know, rules, um, what are we actually trying to protect? Um, and usually in a, in a national security sense, that would be the state, so like a nation state. Um, and if we're thinking about cyber security, it'd be like the cyber system, the cyber system. Um, direction of protection is all about what is, if we think about what is being protected, from whom. So if we think about comparing AI for security versus the security of AI, um, this is one way of thinking about the direction of protection. Um, and it's a fundamental difference. The other one is AI safety versus AI security. In the AI world, there's actually quite a lot of debate about whether AI safety is different to AI security and what safety versus security even means. And it's fascinating to me, maybe not to everyone else, but people in AI get really heated about this because people have very strong opinions. And it's often seen as sort of a, a philosophical question almost. Whereas to me, I, I think it's pretty simple and it comes down to the direction of protection. Like to me, AI safety is protecting the environment from the AI system, whereas AI security is about protecting the system from the environment. And that's how you'd characterize it in a military studies or a cyber security approach as well. Like if we think about the cyber analogy, cyber safety is protecting like people or users from um, like cyber systems that might do them harm. So protecting them from online bullying, making sure there's equitable access to the internet, things like that. Whereas cyber security is about protecting the cyber system from external threat actors. We then arrive at this concept of securitization. Uh, and securitization basically takes the premise that if something is considered an existential threat, then a state is able to use extraordinary measures to protect that thing. So a good example of this is the rise of um, yeah, cy cyber security. So in uh, say 2008 kind of times, we were starting to see um, the cyber attacks on Estonia uh, and Georgia being considered the first instances of cyber war and cyber warfare. And this you know, enabled um, the government to enact lots of cyber security laws and, and measures because the threat was suddenly considered existential when it's applied to, say, a nation state versus when it's just applied to sort of the users. And it's interesting because we've seen this evolution of that take place through terms like computer security versus cyber security. I mean, the discipline of protecting cyber systems used to be called computer security. Um, but as it's gone through this transition to becoming an existential threat and one which warrants additional laws and regulations to protect it, it's become um, cybersecurity. And there's other you know, stories that people have about the evolution of that as well. Um, the point I'm making is that it's a transition that has happened um, alongside the securitization of, uh, of computers and cyber systems. So when we think about this in terms of AI policy, there's a lot we can learn about how to make sure we're creating good AI policy based on those principles and the evolutions that we've seen from cyber. This is a, a, a research paper that um, my team has done recently, which was um, a, a lot of work. Um, but basically, it's, uh, it, it's, it's looking at this. It, it's, it's understanding if AI is going through a securitization process. Um, and so we did a review of public AI policy, which is why I said it was a lot of work. Um, OECD.ai um, currently has a live repository of like all or at least um, hopefully all AI policies in the world. There's 1,937 AI policies in the world, um, at least time of doing this research and based on what they have access to, based on certain requirements and things. 
Um, that's a lot of policy. So we wanted to understand which of these policies, um, or th those three different axes of information, to what extent these policies focused on those. So what did the policy consider as the referent object? Um, how did it consider the direction of security? Um, and then, um, what was it? Did, how did it define AI security? Like, did it define it as AI for cybersecurity? Did it define it as the security of AI? Um, or maybe it was something else. Um, how did they, they think about all of those things? And so we found that out of all of those policies, an overwhelming number of them only considered AI in the context of using it for security. And it wasn't even for cybersecurity, right? It was for national security. Um, I mean, obviously, these are public policies, so that does sort of make sense. Um, but it was so overwhelming that for us, this is really interesting because the, the, the lack of consideration for AI safety in particular was really surprising to me because there is quite a lot of narrative about AI safety at the moment. Um, the lack of consideration for AI security for me was less surprising um, based on all the conversations I have, which I also think is a really big problem. If um, you know, we need to be considering AI security far more. We also looked at who the referent object was in the policy. And especially given that these policies mostly focused on AI for security of the state, it makes sense that the referent object was the nation state. Um, and this was followed by sort of a mixture of the state and the individual, and then the individual, and then the AI. Now, what does, like, it, it does this even matter? These are public policies, you know, is this really what they need to be addressing? This number represents the proportion of cyber policy that focuses on cyber security. 60% of cyber policy focuses on cyber security. Um, why can't we learn these lessons and apply it to AI? Um, Neuromancer is a really good like science fiction book. This is one of my favorite sci-fi books, I think, actually. And it's often credited as the first um, time that the term cyberspace was used. This is written in the, I think, 70s, I believe, by William, William Gibson, and I highly recommend it. Um, and the premise of the book is basically that you can sort of jack into cyberspace physically and then interact with that environment. Um, it's, it's very cool. But the connection here is that most of the time, AI security is considered a subset of cybersecurity. Uh, rightly or wrongly, I, I just want to ask everyone the question to consider. You know, if, if AI represents new risks and a new attack surface, should it be considered a subset of cybersecurity or shouldn't it? So outside of policy, we're starting to see uh, more practitioner-based frameworks that address AI risk. So this example by NIST is pretty good. There's lots of other sorts of taxonomies and references out there. MITRE Atlas is um, a repository of all the TTPs of adversarial machine learning attacks, for example. Um, but we're still sort of going through this maturation process, especially when everything is extremely AI safety focused. Um, this is the model that I typically use to talk about AI security threats. I talk about the three Ds. Those are disrupt, disclose, and deceive. So if we're thinking about that Panda versus Gibbon example, um, if you're able to disrupt the model, it means that that model basically just doesn't re uh, recognize that image as a panda. To deceive, it means that it's able to recognize that image as something specific, like something else, like we want it to be specifically targeted as a given. And disclose means that you're able to leak information about the training data or something like that. A lot of the conversations I have with other AI people are very much that you know, you can solve this problem through technology. Like if you create solutions that basically pen test AI systems, um, you don't need to think about people or process because the AI will be secure. And I can see from some of you in the room that you also don't agree with that premise um, because I definitely don't agree with that premise. And most of the time, it is actually a people and process issue. Um, you know, you can have as much secure technology as you want, but if you're not able to actually create an environment where it supports that security, um, that's, that's really challenging. So I'm sort of at time, but I want to end on, again, because it's the policy village, some discussion points um, or maybe questions. I, I, we might have time for q and I'm not really sure, but I'm really interested to understand from all of you in the room who obviously care about sort of the intersection of AI and security. Um, 
to what extent you think that, you know, policy can actually address these kinds of challenges and how, you know, why is it that we're not seeing more, um, more action around AI security when cyber security is clearly such a big problem um, for all levels of society? You know, the national security implications of AI um, are extreme and we're just not seeing these lessons learned being applied from cyber security and national security into AI security. And so I hope that's something that maybe you take away with you and some questions that you can ask. And I also really want to hear from you as well because I, I want to see AI security more on the agenda. So um, please do keep in touch. Um, yeah, I, I, do we have time for questions? Nope, okay, well, <laughs> stay in touch.